Bodens, welcome back to the channel. Right. Total War Pharaoh is on the agenda today. And well, this could be a long one. So get yourselves comfortable. And of course, get yourselves involved with this debate in the comment section. I'd love to hear your thoughts and talk about it a bit more down below. But before you do, I just want to quickly let you know, I've recently signed up to Threads, the latest of a very long list of new social media platforms. So if you want to go, and if you are set up and signed up to Threads and you want to give me a follow over there, then please do so. The link is in the description of this video. So well, it's been over a month now, hasn't it, since the initial announcement trailer was released. And I covered it, if you remember, at the time, at which point I voiced my concerns over how various aspects of the game will be designed. And I asked the question, really, was this the game that everyone really wanted? Well, now that the, pardon the pun, dust has settled since then, and the community have had time to digest the game and evaluate what we've seen of it so far, I feel it is now a good time to share my honest opinions of Pharaoh. And when I say honest, I mean it because, you know, you're taking the time out of your day to watch this and support the channel. So the least I can do is paint a decent enough picture of where I'm at with the game. And well, surprise, surprise, it, it ain't great. And maybe, well, I'm getting a grumpy old man nowadays and it takes more to impress me than it did when I was a wide-eyed, young, starting up YouTuber over nine years ago. I don't know, but yeah, I'm not in a good place with this game at the moment. So when the first gameplay was released back on the 1st of June, I was away on holiday with the family, so I wasn't able to release any videos like a lot of the other Total War YouTubers did. However, I knew what was coming as I too had played the preview build a few weeks prior and so the gameplay you will see throughout this video is of my recordings that I captured during my time with it. And that period away gave myself time to reflect, to really ensure my mind had been able to form a valid argument for my uneasy feelings with the game to this point. Feelings that I couldn't really say at the time on the trailer announcement video that I did. Now, I'm a content partner with Creative Assembly, to which, of course, I'm extremely grateful for, especially that they've stuck with me, even though there's been a drought of content on the channel till now. So a part of me is concerned, you know, should I be making this video in the first place? Is it going to jeopardize my position with them? But then I take a step back and I think, well, no, I can't be held to account for what is essentially a justified opinion for giving a damn about a franchise that I've played and loved for over two decades. And newsflash, I want nothing more than, of course, for Total War Pharaoh to be a huge success, as that will only help bring on better and more titles for us to enjoy in the future. But in its current state that I see it in, I fear that will not be so. And worst case scenario, this game could be dead on arrival. Will I be playing it at launch? Yes. Why? Because, of course, I am a Total War YouTube channel which showcases the latest games in the series. It would be stupid for me not to. However, does that mean I'm happy with it or I have to like it? You lost today, kid. But it doesn't mean you have to like it. Of course, I want it to be good because I want a great experience in a Let's Play series for both you and I. However, is anything going to drastically change from what we've been shown so far? No. Will the release date be pushed back from October? No. You know, I've seen on social media, Creative Assembly staff who have been playing full campaigns already. And so if you aren't bowled over with what you've seen, well, you're going to be disappointed. Now, you could be saying I'm just being wise after the event. I've judged the mood of the community and then I've jumped on the bandwagon of negativity. That couldn't be further from the truth, as I've had reservations with this game from day one. The moment I clocked eyes on it, I instantly said this is just Troy all over again. Troy, which hasn't been Total War's best iteration 
in the series, let's be honest. You know, it's got the same UI and assets as Troy, same engine mechanics as Troy, will most likely be the same or similar size and scope as Troy. And we all know it's been made by the same team as Troy, Creative Assembly Sophia. And let's be honest, it's focusing on pretty much the same era as Troy, Bronze Age. So you can see that making this game as a transition from Troy wasn't too difficult for Creative Assembly to achieve. But there's two main aspects that don't sit well with me and quite frankly form the basis of why I'm so baffled of what we've seen to date and the arguments against the game in this video. Now one is the price because they are charging here full game AAA prices for the three editions. We've got £50 for the base game, £61 for the deluxe edition and a whopping £77 for the Dynasty Edition. And then to justify the price, they say this. Total War Pharaoh, simply put, is the next big historical Total War. You know, after waiting for so long, forgive me if I wanted slightly more. You know, I kept saying to myself during the game's presentation that we were shown, okay, so they're going to use Troy's base game mechanics and this will just be a filler saga title then at around, what, about £25, and then the next main historical title announcement will follow after in 2024. Nope. Apparently, this is the next main title. And saga titles, well, they just go into a shroud of mystery, haven't they? We don't even hear about them anymore. And Creative Assembly must be confident of the game's success because, as I say, the Dynasty Edition promises four DLCs at least. So from a budget standpoint... They will be guaranteeing investment into this game for quite a while after launch. Well, it's got to be successful for them then, hasn't it? You know, and I go back to scope here. If this is supposed to be then the next big historical total war, you compare that to Warhammer, Creative Assembly's other main IP, and it's just crazy how less innovation there is with this when you compare it to Warhammer. It really is night and day. And I've heard arguments supporting the move for Pharaoh, comparing it with Rome 2 and Attila, an empire to Napoleon, and then even Rome 1 to Medieval 2. Well, those iterations of Attila and Napoleon weren't charging full game prices for them, nor did they claim to be the next big historical total war. And the latter, Medieval 2, being similar to the UI of Rome 1, fine, but then... That game was completely different in the time period. The whole feel of the game was different. It had different cultures, units. Everything was completely different. Okay, the UI was the same, but everything else, totally different. Troy and Pharaoh are pretty much the same period. You know, I read somewhere which sums it up pretty well. Is that in short, it is Troy represented in a different source without the saga appellation in front of it. Personally, there's just not enough wow factor. And even though there is some cool features, there's no groundbreaking progressive gameplay features to justify either the price or it being the next big title. And before you even knew what you had, you, you patented it and packaged it and slapped it on a plastic lunchbox. And now you're selling it. You want to sell it. Well, I, I don't think you're giving us our due credit. So that's where we're at, really. A full main historical title at full price, which basically boils down to being an enhanced version of Troy. Let's be honest. However, we have to be fair. We need to break this down in more depth and, and look at all aspects, both good and bad, because there is some positives which we'll talk about. You know, this is a critique at the end of the day. But the first main bugbear I have is around the features which are in the game. So, as I say, you know, there's nothing groundbreaking. But yes, while there are positive additions, for example, dynamic weather and terrain and fire effects, one, they're not revolutionary, as I say, and two, they're just additions which have been brought back from previous titles and then are being used as major selling points of the game. When they're just features which worked previously, the community liked them, they then stripped them out and brought them back again. They don't give anything new to the franchise. And, they, you know, again, full game price here, main historical title. Keep them at the front of your mind with all these points that they're going to be making. This is the state we're at, really. Currently, where new ideas are just mechanics we've had 10 years ago. And they're being hailed as revolutionary selling points 
to a game, it's pretty bad. Now, on the flip side of that, a lot of people I've seen concerned about this because of the of time period and the setting of Pharaoh is a point that is that people are worried about the unit diversity. Well, that doesn't actually concern me because from what I've seen so far, they've done a pretty good job of giving us an array of units across different factions in the game, different cultures. You know, at the end of the day, this is an historical game. It's not Warhammer. The unit variety isn't going to be insane. What it needs to be, though, is realistic, and I'm okay with that. I think we've been spoilt with Warhammer for the last few years, and this isn't that. It's going to be a lot more grounded and realistic in that approach. And another aspect I am very pleased with that they are reviving. However, it's still, again, from previous titles, but I don't mind this as much. It needed to come back is the matched combat. Finally, we won't have infantry lines just poking their spears at each other until one drops dead. Instead, we'll see the immersive battles, which will hopefully lead to a more cinematic and fluid style of combat on the battlefield. You know, they will have weapon-specific animations, so animations which are shown will be from a library for any given weapon, for example, spears and axes. So instead of it just playing out a random animation, it will actually be specific to that weapon. And it also takes into account the weapon that the other unit, the enemy unit, is fighting the other unit against, if you know what I mean. There's also armor degradation, which will add to the realism. So as the battle goes on and a unit's armor takes more damage and begins to weaken, so will decrease the unit's ability to withstand damage. Of course, once a unit's armor is fully broken, their overall health will decrease rapidly, of the unit that is. I would have liked to have seen that enhanced even further though, as I would want to have seen some sort of character's ability or building within the sieges that could restore the unit's armor in a kind of zone of control. But to counter these positives, you've then got these health bars of of the units which Creative Assembly insist on having and it just feels to be dumbing down the experience for the player. It feels, I feel, it gives a kind of an unrealistic approach to units taking damage because it's taking into account the overall health of the entire unit's HP and not the individual soldiers. So the result is it creates scenarios where units only begin to die at the same time when the HP hits a certain level and not units dying from the start, it's all kind of happening at once and it's not realistic and it's just stupid. And charges were very underwhelming in the build that I played to the point where they felt non-existent at times. Okay, I know this is a work in progress, so there's time to improve on this, but it was so disappointing to see chariots just slowly merging into infantry units instead of smashing into their lines and smashing the units to pieces upon the impact of the charge. I mean, these are chariots, one of the key components and weapons of the Bronze Age. That really needs improvements before release because, in fact, the whole unit collision and cohesion at times just felt so strange currently. I mean, chariots, they should cause so much damage. It was, it was really non-existent. Just terrible. Now, the addition of formation and stances, possibly inspired by the game Manor Lords with this, oh yeah, you know, all well and good. But yet because the battles just play out like any other Total War battle, I really didn't find the need to use them at all. And they've also said that the pacing of the battles have been slowed down. Really? I was winning them in usually around five to six minutes, which is the average time for recent Total War games. And this, of course, then goes on to hamper the dynamic weather feature because, yes, I like it as a feature, but the battle's still finishing too quickly. It really negates the impact it can have on the armies. If you had a 20-minute plus clash, then great. It would have the time and the conflict for the buffs and debuffs that a change in weather can bring to potentially make a meaningful impact and swing the outcome of the fight. But no, the weather just comes in and then the battle could be done currently within another two minutes. It's just not enough time for that feature, which is a big feature what they are, you know, advertising it as to make any impact on the on the battle. 
Now, how does the game look? Personally, guess what? I love it. The visuals and maps are gorgeous. The graphics in both battle and campaign, I cannot fault them. This was never an issue with Troy. Visually outstanding for me. The colors, the vistas, the overall golden look is spot on. Even on the campaign map, they've managed to replicate the beauty of the Nile, the lush vegetation areas around it. And they've done enough to make it appealing, I feel, and engaging to the player, which won't have been easy when a lot of Egypt is just sprawling deserts and sand. Plus the variations in how the map can change in its appearance, given the civilization shifts that Egypt finds itself in at any given time during the campaign, is a very neat addition. But the UI, oh my god, no, I really don't like this and I could make an entire video about it. It is a major bugbear of mine over the last few historical games. It just feels dumbed down and oversimplified for the player, which in turn makes it look arcadey and that it's from a mobile game. And there's really no diversity amongst the factions it's just your generic green icons for your troops and then red for the enemy. This makes it so frustrating when you're trying to quickly understand in the heat of battle, you know, to try and differentiate units between yours and theirs. And there's no banners, there's no flag bearers. I mean, flag bearers, they were in the trailer, for God's sake. Not on the actual game. And it's really unfortunate as they add a lot to the battles and the immersion when you zoom in to the combat. You know, 3K, Three Kingdoms had banners galore. Rome 2 as well, Warhammer. It's these little details that really make a difference for the final product. You know, this and Troy just had dumbed down icons that are soulless. The UI in general, which is again a copy and paste of Troy, just feels very basic to me. Too much like a mobile game. I don't know if they're trying to make it more accessible for new players. But it just comes across as far too simplistic. Now, one of the battles we had access to was a siege battle. And it's great to see, again, large, full, 360-degree city sieges. And, of course, it's what any strategical Total War player wants. That epic, grounded city battle on a large scale. And they do have a very similar look and feel to Rome too. So you know, I'm happy with that. And there's been some welcome changes that have been made to them as well. Again, from previous titles, but they have been uh, brought back to the game series. And they've removed the, the ass ladders for infantry, which is great. Um, gates are now unbreakable for infantry. So you need to use siege equipment to fight and attack the city. Wall sapping, however, unlike in Rome 1, where it happens in real time on the battle map, it now occurs, I believe, pre-battle, which is probably more realistic if we're honest with ourselves. You don't want to, but you may want to see it real time, but realistically, all that was done pre-battle. But they've added fire to destroy settlements and trees and buildings in the settlements. So then, obviously, the more fire damage has occurred, the more lasting effect it will have post battle so if you do take the city it's going to cost you more to repair it and uh, and get it back to full kind of health again um victory points in cities are back from shogun to total war so that will give buffs to your army or debuffs to the enemy factions and i believe they're trying to go for this because they don't want to try and have it where as a defending army you're just camping and trying to defend certain alleyways in the city because if you have victory points around it it requires you to maneuver potentially to counter the attacking army taking these victory points you can't just camp in certain alleyways and things like that so that's why they've added that i believe again you know while these are great to see the attacking ai from what i experienced in that preview battle was just too easy again as we know, AI can make or break any Total War battle, especially when it comes to sieges. And the siege that we had to uh, try out was labelled as being very hard. Well, this recording you're seeing now was the second time I played it, and I got an heroic victory very easily on that second try. This wasn't challenging at all. In fact, I think I got an heroic victory 
on the first attempt as well. You know, be fair though, for the most part, it is a scripted battle. And for the AI, this is only one example. Other clashes could be a lot different and a lot harder. But for this one, it wasn't challenging really at all. And so could that be down to the AI? We'll have to wait and see. Players now, though, will be able to build their own unique bodyguards by equipping their generals with various armor, shields, weapons, and mounts. So, effectively, what that will allow you to do is prepare better for an upcoming battle. So, if you see an enemy force attacking you or coming towards you to attack you, and you can scout out their army build, then you can equip your general unit to be a certain type you know so it could be mounted on chariots it could be sword and shield it could be you know different mounts different weapon varieties i believe and those visual changes that you make will appear on the campaign map and on the battle map i believe as well so as i say you can prepare differently for a upcoming battle depending on who you're fighting against so that's quite good that's quite neat to see i like that it gives variation to the player so yeah i'm happy that that is in the game Let's just move briefly over to the campaign side now. I've talked about the battle element. Let's talk about the campaign. Because I could go on and on in this video covering every aspect of the game. I'm sure even then I would have missed something. But at the time of making this video right now, I've had no hands-on experience with the campaign. Not one bit. Of course, if I do in any form of early access to that, I will create some videos on live gameplay at the time, much like I would have done if I'd had that ability to record this battle build before now. But hey, that's if I've not been kicked out of the content program by then. If I do get hands-on with it, I'll be able to give you my thoughts in much more depth than I can do right now. But to put it bluntly, if there's any area that could potentially save Pharaoh, it's going to be, I feel, with the campaign. We may look back at this being the deal-breaker and I truly believe this is where the game's success could be achieved. Now, I've heard that 3K was similar in this regard, where the battles were poor, but the campaign was fantastic. And I can't really comment on that because I've never played Three Kingdoms. And well, that game on its own and the situation surrounding it is a completely separate debate in itself, if I'm honest with you. However, if we get what seems to be promised an Attila-style apocalypse, Bronze Age collapse narrative within this campaign, well, that could go some way to making the game have some longevity to it. If the campaigns were to offer a variation in outcomes for the player, that will help its life cycle as well. Again, not something brand new, but at least it's something the community liked from the Attila title. Now, I have to say, though, I was pretty disappointed and bewildered to hear that apparently Pharaoh will not include any family trees, any character aging or deaths. Really? This is, <laughs> this is ancient Egypt where their history is centered around dynasties and legacies of pharaohs where the royal families and their very dubious lineage, if you get my drift, and deaths were a massive aspect of daily lives in that time period. Either that alone could have provided a very interesting mechanic to your campaign. It could have, it could have offered a lot of different outcomes and role-playing potential. But they've completely stripped it. It's not in the game, from what I believe. What, what a huge loss that is. But what there is in the game, I believe, is a legitimacy slash civil war mechanic which works within your faction and it appears it kind of a race to be pharaoh between you and the other faction leaders it's kind of a, a mechanic very reminiscent to the warhammer vortex the race for the vortex or the chaos rifts which you know when you're constantly competing against the ai and there is a certain things that you can do i believe on the campaign like building monuments capturing wonders and certain settlements that will boost your legitimacy ranking. I do like that though. You know, that is a narrative driven feel to how, you know, that could work in the campaign. It will aid you as a player to push the campaign forward and of course add purpose to the playthrough with that sense of direction. But then to have that, but not the <laughs> the aging and the family trees, it, it, it would work so well hand in hand, but no, 
that that's too much, is it? I don't know. And I see that the resource mechanic that existed in Troy has migrated across, which I kind of liked personally. However, I thought the AI would handle it badly on occasions. You know, I'd find that the end turn phase was just dominated with the other factions offering stupid deals for resources, for your resources on net and you're bartering for theirs. And it ended up as being you know, the end turn phase as being one big bartering session at times. And it could be manipulated. I remember when Troy first came out, there was a couple of ways you could exploit the system and get ridiculous amount of golds out of it. Um, but yeah, obviously that was that was uh, that was fixed pretty soon after the game was launched. But if they're going to add resources, I wish they would have expanded on the mechanic potentially. You know, just not just copying and pasting it from from Troy. Add to it, enhance it, because it could have gone down like the Chaos Dwarf resource routes where you could you know mix elements together for example you know you could mix copper and tin to make bronze have that kind of mechanic in the game and hopefully it probably won't be but they should expand upon the four main resources in the game so you can produce and trade other variants like quartz which is a massive very important uh you know crafting ware within ancient Egypt and also clay was sourced massively from the river Nile for things like pottery and crafting so those things should be to give a realistic experience for the player those should be ex they should be included in the game you know I feel like this video could be over an hour long if I talk about every single micro part of the game as I say but there is other notables that I've seen included in the campaign and they are things like outposts, the mechanic which is returning, again, returning, albeit very structured, whereby you can't really determine where they're placed, but outposts are coming back. Character progression with competencies, which has replaced the skill tree, I believe, and dynamic traits, which will shape your character and how they will progress in the campaign. And one thing that I found out about when I was making this video and doing the script for this video is that you can customize your faction traits so they will you know, help to give you a varied campaign and add again longevity to a playthrough because you can sort of customize them as an overall campaign for your faction which is something that is new so i quite like that and little things like this i do you know commend them for as you can see they're trying to give the player more of a sandbox experience and trying to give longevity, as I say, to the campaign. But it's the features that are within that experience, which we've seen before, which are the problem for me. They're not groundbreaking. They're not absolutely brand new features. And maybe that's why they're trying to give this longevity to the campaign, because they're aware that they're possibly worried that players are going to get bored very easily so they're trying to give as much to the player to offer variation and customization that they can possibly do to to keep you engaged potentially i don't know but as i say essentially to do this campaign justice i need to get hands on with it as then i can critique it and showcase it to you with some live gameplay a little bit like this video but i'll probably do it a bit more live real time on the campaign map with that video so even so, we now know pretty much all the mechanics of the campaign and what this game will offer to the player. And the ultimate question is, is that enough? Is it enough for the consumer to pay full game prices in what has been labelled as a full historical title when the evidence points to an improved, updated Troy experience? Even with the fancy updates the campaign offers that we know so far, I fear so much more is needed to keep the player base invested enough for the long haul and to justify what they are saying that Pharaoh actually is as a game. And it could well be that in 2024, we will in fact still get the next actually big historical total war at the very least it is announced potentially next year and so this was even though branded otherwise a stopgap until that point i mean the credit assembly team over in the uk must be working on something other than 
the DLC for Warhammer. And I do feel whatever happens, the point that I'm trying to make here is as well that Total War is crying out for a fresh update in its titles. It desperately needs a new game engine now for me because we've not had that since the days of uh, it transitioning from Medieval 2 to Empire. Empire and the engines we've had since Empire, well, it's the same engine. It's just been tweaked a little bit. It's not a change like it was for Medieval to Empire. So that, you know, needs to be done because it will give a major reset and revamp to the franchise. And I think as well, we're in a strange place with Total War, if I'm honest. You know, you look at it because Warhammer has pretty much dominated the Total War scene since 2016. And the community, even the Total War YouTubers that are out there, are so divided with Historical and Warhammer that there doesn't seem to be any continuity across the board anymore. And that's not only with the community and the YouTubers, it's also with the the company as well, I think, for, for a little bit. It, it's not how it was, certainly not how it was when I first started YouTube, that's for sure. And, you know, even, you know, even historical Total War YouTubers, they've come and gone. They're just gone. And you get, you can see so many channels that are out there now that are just literally all concentrating on Warhammer. They are forming their entire channel on Warhammer. And it just, there's just a divide. There's no, as I say, seamless continuity anymore, I don't feel. Anyway, I'll wrap it up here, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've enjoyed this video and my two cents on the situation with Pharaoh at the moment. As I said, feel free to discuss it and we can keep the conversation going down below in the comments section. And, and of course, you may not even agree with what I'm saying and that's totally cool. If I want to hear your opinions, if it's totally different to mine, no problem. I will still want to hear what you've got to say. So as I say, keep a lookout for any more Pharaoh content in the future. And now that I've finally completed this video, it took me ages to write the script and get it all edited up. I can move on to getting ready to start our Let's Plays on the channel, the series that I'm going to start up over the next week or so. So I'm very looking forward to getting to uh, get stuck into them. But until that point, I shall say, take care and farewell, Spartans.